Do y'all think that the better team won, or was this just a bad game? Got a, they got a cloud hanging over their head. You execute when you're supposed to execute, and we didn't do that. They were the better team in that game. Hello, everyone. It's Wes. Uh, we've arrived at that time of year where we are really put to the test when it comes to allowing 18 to 22 year olds playing a game on a field to determine our mental health. Well, hang on. That's not actually true. Uh, these days, a lot of them are 25, 26, 27 and beyond. <clears throat> so uh, at, at any rate, uh, I'm just kidding. But seriously, that actually happens. Uh, this time of year, as we get into the thick of conference play, sometimes hit or miss when it comes to matchups. But this year, it's almost all hit <laughs> uh, because we have and will continue to get some really, really big matchups as we roll along. So uh, but first, let's uh, check in with the greatest co-hosts in all the land. First off, Jesse, how's it going? How are you doing? Feeling a little rested from a bye week, but certainly missing watching the tide. So it's Georgia hate week, but we'll get there. Matt, how you feeling, my friend? I'm I'm doing great. I'm just sitting here sipping on a uh, on a, a Oklahoma fan tears because their their Twitter was whoo oh boy they were all over the place this weekend. So mm. Matt, it, it, tasty it, stuff. It, Tasty stuff. As if you didn't already have an appreciation, and I know you do, but if we could put like a clip of you like five or six years ago talking about Tennessee football next oh. to a clip of you talking right now, I just like just the places that Tennessee has gone. And it's uh it's been a, we, a cool I'm not a Tennessee fan, but it's it's been impressive to watch. So yeah. anyway. I, I I'm I'm still we're gonna talk about it when we talk about the Oklahoma game. but but yeah, I uh I'm feeling a lot better than I was five years ago. That's a fact. I hear you. Well, we'll talk about that one and some of the other exciting games uh, right now. All right, so last week's games, the first one we'll talk about was Florida at Mississippi State. Uh, Florida won here 45 to 20 to 28. I got the point. Uh, this was uh, our uh, self-dubbed uh, dumpster fire game of the week. Um, it was, uh, and let, let's not forget the, uh, essentially the entire starting offense for Mississippi state is new, uh, and most of their defense as well. Uh, in, in this game, there was essentially no defense, as you can tell by the score and no discipline. Uh, that was kind of my notes from this game, no defense, no discipline. Uh, the heat was kind of a theme, uh, throughout most of the games across this week. And I think exhaustion and fatigue was a big factor, uh, in the defensive sloppiness here, especially as the game went along. Uh, Florida and Billy Napier get a much needed win here. Uh, Blake Chapin uh, exited this game, quarterback for Mississippi State exited this game with a shoulder uh, with a shoulder injury. And they recently gave an update that unfortunately he will miss the remainder of the season due to that injury. So I uh, uh, hate to hear that. Uh, Michael Van Buren Jr. who came in when Chapin was injured uh, will get the start this upcoming weekend. Matt, uh, what's your take on Florida Mississippi State? Well, we know that uh, Billy needed a win pretty badly, and I feel like this may take a little bit of heat off his uh, chair, just a hair, but not by uh, a ton. Flor but Florida did need a W something fierce. Um, woof, woof at that MSU defense. Like, I knew that Mississippi State was going to be a couple of, you know, levels behind a, a chunk of the SEC, but I was not aware of how bad uh, that situation had gotten. I mean, they made Mertz look like a superstar uh, especially when he struggled against other teams. And that's usually an indication that things aren't going really well. Um, speaking of Florida's uh, ability to move the ball, I am a little bit curious as to how this whole Mertz lagway kind of twofer is going to work out. Um, we know, excuse me, from in the past, anytime you have that whole two headed monster at quarterback, it's not necessarily going to work out real well. Sometimes it does. But I don't know. I'm not sold on it, and I don't think it's going to get any better going forward. I think this is just an example of Florida catching a pretty weak MSU team at home. Yeah. Or, sorry, a weak MSU team on the road. There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jesse, your thoughts on this one? <clears throat> yeah, I think you mentioned kind of undisciplined play, but I mentioned it the past couple of weeks, so I'm going to do it again. Eight penalties for 70 yards for Mississippi State. That's 
that's never a good thing. Um, but for a team that's struggling right now, you can't put yourself in negative situations. Uh, it's just harder to overcome. And then also there were 21 unanswered points that Florida scored in the second quarter. E not great. You know, you just, it seems like there's obviously an identity <coughs> there, but again, it's something that if Mississippi state was going to do it, Florida might've been the team to do it against. Um, but Florida desperately needed this win. I mean, they really did. I don't think it saves Billy Napier's job, but it might've made it a little less vitriolic when they fire him. Right. And we had talked about why they're waiting and maybe because they're, you know, trying to figure out Lane Kiffin's contract, but probably not. Uh, some people in the, in the comments were talking about how um, the, maybe the real reason they're playing it slow is to, uh, you know, get those first few games of the season in where kids can't, you know, red shirt and go ahead and transfer out. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. they're slow playing it that way. So kids won't just abandon ship left and right, maybe. I don't know. So um, interesting to to see what happens in the next few weeks there. Um, all right, next, let's talk about Arkansas at Auburn. Uh, Arkansas winning this one 24 to 14. You know, uh, Jesse is the only one to pick Arkansas here, so she gets the point here. Uh, this game was a turnover fest. Um, <laughs> Hank Brown started this one, but after three picks, he gave way to Peyton Thorne once again, and he provided a spark. But uh, it was too little, too late, and Arkansas was able to add on to their lead late in the game to put things away. Uh, Arkansas, and I've kind of said this, Arkansas has some real firepower on offense. It's just not always consistent. You don't know what's going to happen. So uh, they did find a, a way to get it done here. Uh, Auburn, on the flip side, has some real serious soul searching to do. When when Hugh Freeze is supposedly the quarterback whisperer but can't seem to find a solid option at the position, um, I know it's you know very early on in his tenure still. I'm not saying he's not the guy. He's not going to work out there. Um, but again, like I've said in the past, he, he, he's won everywhere he's been. Uh, it, it just might take a little bit longer at Auburn, given the level of competition and and, and all that stuff. So um, super happy for Sam Pittman after this one. Um, you know, I always love to to see him do well. Um, but uh, but yeah, Jesse, what were your thoughts on this one? I'm, I'm sure you have some uh, being, uh, you know, that it's Auburn. I was the only one to pick them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think for me and the reason I I wanted to pick Arkansas other than, you know, it being against Auburn, but. I think Arkansas to me has just shown that they can potentially get it done. They've obviously had some, some slip ups that they, they need to take care of, but to me, they have a little bit more grit to them and, and a better outlook. Auburn, I just don't know their identity. I couldn't tell you. And, and I don't know that they do, especially now seeing the issues that they're having with two potential quarterbacks. I don't think there's an answer at quarterback for them right now. And it's like you mentioned with Hugh Freeze supposedly being this, amazing quarterbacks coach what what are we doing that we've seen in the past where Auburn has to get lots of transfer quarterbacks and big deal transfer quarterbacks to get things done and and I don't I don't know I I think the boosters in Auburn again we've talked about it they're not very patient people they're people that are very clearly willing and able to pay out to to get somebody to leave so that they can bring somebody else in Hugh Freeze was supposed to be this big name hire, somebody, you know, big splash back in the SEC. And I just haven't seen it uh, from him last year or this year. But Arkansas, this is a great way to start off SEC play. I think this is what they needed. They're playing for Coach Pittman. We like Coach Pittman. And with how things went last year, this team really needed to step up to, to get him out of a hot seat, you know? Um, so I think they're they're showing their grit. And a key snap that I saw was they converted nine of 19 third down attempts and two out of four of the fourth down attempts. So Bobby Petrino's offense is coming back in <laughs> to Fayetteville um, and they're leading the nation in third down conversion rate. So some positive things for, for the Razorbacks to build upon, but Auburn, it's like you said, I think there's some soul searching that needs to be done. And I would imagine that there are some, fiery emails being sent from boosters to coach freezes email this week probably matt it's funny jesse that you mention uh how this is a team that doesn't seem to have much of an identity i feel like that's something that can be ascribed to a lot of teams 
in the former SEC West this year. LSU has been kind of a team that's been a little bit back and forth. Missouri, as we're going to see, is another team where we're not sure which way the wind's blowing on. Uh, Texas A&M. I feel like there's a bunch of teams that we just we, – it's too early. It's only been four games. We don't know where we're at. Um, speaking of Hugh Freeze, when when this hire happened, I was convinced it was a home run for the athletic department at uh, at Auburn. And now it just seems like a pop-up fly in the infield. Um, he can't really seem to get a whole lot going. Uh, and again, I know that, you know, in the in the post-Nick Saban era, the Saban effect, we've trademarked that here at Pigskins and Pageantry, um, we've discussed the Saban effect and how it, it, it shortens the time period uh, that people are patient. And I think maybe we need to continue being patient with Hugh Freeze, but we got to see some sort of signs of life here soon because – um, and five turnovers, like what are we even doing uh, at the QB position if he's throwing throwing three picks and then uh, lost a fumble and then Thorne also with an interception? I mean, is it a scheme thing? Is it a Jimmy and Joe's thing? Uh, I can't really tell you right now. I think we'll have a better indication by the end of the season uh, if it is a player thing or if it's a scheme thing. Maybe the game's passed up Hugh Freeze and he was successful at Liberty because it was Liberty. I, I just don't know. Um, it might be that like, that actor that had like one really good role and you're like, wow. And then they, mm. you know, maybe they go to rehab, maybe they do whatever. And then when they come out, you're hoping that it's going to be better. You, you've seen them in a couple TV movies. There might be a spark. So you put them back on the big screen and then it's just not the same. And, and so that might be it. So basically you're saying Hugh Freeze is the Tom Sizemore of the SEC. Yes. Yes, I am. That's that's rough. That's rough. Back so to you, Wes. After uh, after they come out of rehab, they're just no fun to watch anymore. So, <laughs> you know, there's that entertainment factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. Well, let's move to UCLA at L- uh, LSU. Um, yeah, LSU winning here pretty big, thirty four to seventeen in the end. Uh, Jesse gets the point here as well. Uh, great effort by U- UCLA, though, after an embarrassing loss to Indiana last week. Uh, they were actually in this game for a little while. Uh, LSU's defense still struggled, giving up big plays as they've done a lot this year, uh, but they were able to kind of turn things up enough to hold off uh, Ethan Garbers and UCLA in the second half. Matt, what were your thoughts on uh, LSU and UCLA here? Well, I think that LSU ends up taking care of business. Um, granted, it was a home game for them, so they got a little bit of an advantage there. Um, but when you look across the board, no turnovers, over 400 yards in the air, they scored – uh, a little over 30, which if you look at the rest of the season so far, uh, every game that they've won, they've scored over 30 with the exception of that USC game. They only got 20. Um, I think when when the offense is doing what it's supposed to, LSU can win games. Um, Nussmeyer look, had himself a game. I mean, we'll talk about him a little bit later when we get to helmet stickers. Spoiler warning. Um, but, you know, I think we're going to have a better idea of where LSU is as a team after we see them play Ole Miss. Um, if they can come in and, you know, challenge Ole Miss and sl- slow down, slow, slow down that slow. Deep, that offense and, yeah, and do the things that they're supposed to, then maybe, maybe LSU can be in contention. But as of right now, the jury's still out. Yeah. Um, Jesse, your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think Matt hit it on the head there. It's, it's one of the games where you're like, all right, there, there could be some good positive things happening in Death Valley. But I don't know that UCLA is is the team that's going to show us who LSU is. Obviously, on the yeah. stat line, great night for them. Very consistent. No turnovers compared to UCLA's two. So I'm, I'm interested to continue to watch this LSU team. Uh, I think this is going to be a potentially big year for Brian Kelly and seeing what his impact at LSU will be. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, let's move to Vanderbilt at Missouri. Miz went in here thirty to twenty seven. Uh, Matt Fair got the, Matt got the point here. Uh, it's a great game if you love field goals, both made and missed. Um, so a total of ten field goals attempted in this one, uh, five missed and five made. Um, so I don't know if y'all remember, but the decision by Drinkwitz to go for it on fourth down on their own side of the field right before half. Uh, which they failed to convert and led to a Vandy, a long Vandy field goal, uh, didn't end up coming back to bite him in the end, although it could have and almost did. 
Um, I was uh, I was sad that Vandy couldn't come through in the end, but honestly, I wasn't necessarily surprised. Um, Jesse, what were your your thoughts on this close one for Miz? We were so close, and by <laughs> we, I mean Vanderbilt. <laughs> so I close. Mean, just think about it. Vandy could easily have been four and zero this season. Oh like, yeah, they were so close, but they they gave it away in in the final minute um or the final couple minutes i just i don't know i just i i struggle with this um i think this is the game and oftentimes we have it when programs get really really hyped right for for mizzou back in 2014 it was against bama right like it was in the sec championship they were in the East. They were the big deal. They had just gotten to the conference. It it was like, holy cannoli, they're for real. They played Bama and got boat raced. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they didn't get boat raced by Vanderbilt. That's not what I'm saying. But this is a humility check game. This is that trap game mm-hmm. where you go in and you have checked off every toughness Tuesday out there. You feel like you are ready to lace up and show out and that it's going to be easy and that you're ready to take on bigger opponents. And then Vanderbilt comes in and says, not so fast, my friend. We were so close. Um, And I think Coach Drinkwitz in some of those those play calling uh, decisions is probably going to be journaling this week and reflecting quite a bit. Uh, He may have his own, you know, toughness Tuesday. He may have potentially a little wine Wednesday. Um, So... (laughs) was the double game yeah um yeah so they couldn't get it done in a couple of overtimes matt or vandy that is couldn't get it done in a couple of overtimes matt your thoughts uh to to, y'all y'all i'm assuming both of you have watched uh america's next top model uh yes yes, the Mm -hmm. meme okay yes that's exactly what i'm channeling here Mm -hmm. uh i feel like to quote the great philosopher tyra banks we were rooting for you. I, I, I know I was. Uh, I think I've made my feelings about Drinkwitz and the entire University of Missouri very clear uh, on the podcast. I'm still waiting to hear back from uh, if we're going to actually have a Mizzou person on. I would love to. Well, I may one, not be. One able. day we will. I don't know what you're going to um, do, Matt. I don't know. So. I, I may just have to mute my mic and just sit there and do this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I was I was pulling for Vandy because uh, Vandy's been that you know aside from the Georgia State stumble last week, uh, Georgia uh, I'm sorry Vanderbilt's been kind of the the kind of got that little bit of a swagger to them, and um, it's just unfortunately didn't pan out for them. Um, I was really hoping Vanderbilt was going to find a way to pull this off. I hate that you lose a game on a missed field goal in overtime. Those are the yeah. absolute worst, uh, and I feel especially bad about Vandy's kicker, but. Especially uh, if he'd made that massive field goal I, at, at half I, too. It's super impressive. It's just a it's just a bad, bad feeling all around. But uh and, Missouri and fans, don't survives. come for him. Do, yeah, no, yeah. don't do that to him. Don't, don't come don't. for him. They are already on anxiety medication. And if you're one of the people mailing death threats, like just don't be do is that your, happening? I, I don't know, but I know it happened. Oh, okay. It happened to our program. Like Yeah, but Bama at the kicker misses, he's a five star. He shouldn't be missing. Be I would better. hope Mandy's a little more relaxed i, I don't hope. know maybe they're not I but I, would I, hope. I don't know maybe it got worse because their their expectations were low to begin with and then all of a sudden you got a chance to be the top 10 team on the road and then right yeah. oof, there it went Remember, uh, but I, be kind but i but i think that that this kind of illustrates the point that this is why we don't need preseason rankings and why we don't need any rankings until about week eight and then in like week it. eight you could put out whatever rankings you want to but i really think that they're 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 the proverbial rat poison before you get to about week five. I agree. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't like it. I wish they wouldn't do it, but they they will continue to do it because it drives interest. Um, and you know those numbers by the name or by the teams, it, you know it really really drives ratings. I think so. Mm-hmm. I don't see that changing. Um, all right. Well, let's move to the last game that we're going to talk about. Uh, the, one of the most exciting games of the day, probably the most exciting game of the day in terms of SEC play, at least. Uh, Tennessee at Oklahoma, Tennessee winning here 25 to 15. Jesse gets the point here. Uh, Both defenses really good in this game. 
Mm -hmm. um, both mm -hmm. defenses. Tennessee made more plays on offense, and Oklahoma, I mean, they kind of helped them out in that both times Tennessee fumbled the ball away. Oklahoma not only couldn't capitalize, but they just they fumbled it right back to them. Um, on that OU offense, uh, I thought Hawkins looked much better than Arnold in that offense. Uh, who knows what would have happened if he'd played the whole time, but, you know, neither here nor there now, I suppose. Uh, all in all, though, uh, credit to Tennessee, a complete win for the Vols in pretty much every uh, asset or facet, <laughs> aspect, facet of the game. Um, I don't really like uh, Tennessee, but it was a feel-good story for Hypel, and he was emotional in the locker room afterwards, and you couldn't really help but be, be moved by that. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a touching moment. So, Matt, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts? on this game i uh <laughs> i told y'all when the game started I, I unfortunately was at a dinner with some friends of mine i didn't get a chance to watch this until yesterday um but needless to say i kept in between courses because we went to some fancy restaurant we paid like 200 bucks for it was trash anyway i'm not going to get into it if i pay that kind of money i want like a meal not like <laughs> bird food but anyway right. um said the fat kid but anyway uh so i'm checking updates and getting scores and i got a chance to watch like the first quarter and then I, we went to dinner um but needless to say i was i was pleased uh with how things turned out um i was super nervous uh saturday afternoon thinking about this game because i was like tennessee's on the road this is one of those situations where you know tennessee in the past 10 years has been just they these are not games we win um, you're on the road against a top 15 opponent. Usually that's not something, it's not a recipe for success if you wear the orange and white over the last six, seven, eight, 10, 15 years. Um, in fact, this is the first time that Tennessee has a top 15 road win since 2006. Um, so it's been a hot minute since that, uh, that actually happened. Um, I was, again, defense was super impressive. I thought that the uh, defensive line did a great job of kind of keeping uh offense off or oklahoma's offense off balance um dante thornton is an absolute beast um i'm still waiting on squirrel white to kind of get his mojo going um he was one of my uh picks at the beginning of the season to have a real big real big season this year and it hasn't really happened yet i think he's only had like <clears throat> I think one game he had like 80, 60 something yards, and that was on one carry of like, or one catch like 40 something yards. So I'm still waiting for Squirrel White. But Dante Thornton's a, a, an absolute beast. Brew McCoy's a beast. Nico looks good, um, aside from a couple of missteps as far as the turnovers go. Uh, he had, he, again, kudos to Oklahoma. Their defensive line and their linebacker court did a pretty good job of pressuring him in spots. Um, Dylan Sampson and Deshaun Bishop continue to show what that RB1 and RB2 um two-headed monster looks like now granted they're getting roughly if you do the numbers uh they're getting about four yards of carry but four yards of carry is still pretty dadgum good especially when you're looking at how good of an, a defense you're looking at in oklahoma um I, I think oklahoma's got a star in the making with michael hawkins he looked pretty good when he came in for a relief as well i keep an eye on his development and then the one last thing i'll say about this game um aside and i'll talk about coach heupel and all that stuff in just a second but what the hell was up with the field? It, it just seemed like people were slipping and sliding everywhere, and it hadn't rained in Norman that morning, so I'm not sure what the, the turf was. The turf was super long, right? Um, yeah, it, it looked so. awful. And there was a giant, like some poor kid stepped in a hole at some point, like a gopher had run through there. It was just, it was, it was, I'm not going to sit here in judgment on the grounds crew at the University of Oklahoma, but you got to kind of reevaluate. If you're going to be in the SEC, we at least got, and I, I, I know I, can, I can't really say much because, Todd Gurley at Knoxville. Anyway, um, you know, the grounds need to be fed. It'd be, something needs to happen. Something needs to happen. Well, it, it definitely drew the attention of uh, the ESPN's crew as well because they were examining it mm -hmm. also. So, yes. uh, yeah, for sure. Jesse, your thoughts? I mean, I think Matt covered most of it. I'll go back to my penalty corner and just say that Tennessee needs to clean it up a little bit. It, it was, was a sloppy game. There it was very sloppy, sloppy aspects. I mean, great game. Obviously, they pulled out a huge win against a newcomer to the SEC that I think everyone's been kind of curious how they would match up against more historic SEC teams. But Tennessee had 10 penalties for 82 yards compared to Oklahoma's three penalties for 32 yards. So something that as you get into the third week of October, maybe don't clean up, but 
whatever. No, that's we're, we're, coach, coach going to get them right. Don't worry. We'll be ready um, for that game. But it, but it is something to keep an eye on because, you know, with turnovers plus penalties, that can that can really shoot you in the foot. And there are teams that you can't always pull back uh, from when you when you have that happen. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's uh, just kind of scoot through some of these others. I just had a couple of notes here uh, for South Carolina against Akron. Lenora Sellers was out of the game again. Robbie Ashford started that one. And then Bowling Green, Texas A&M was closer than it probably should have been. Wigman was out again for this one and Marcel Reed. Uh, got the start. So just a, a few notes there uh, for the pick them. Uh, Jesse is now leading 21. Uh, I've got 20 and Matt has eight again. I'm getting awesome. hammered. Awesome. I'm getting annihilated. <laughs> well, like I'm fun. getting completely just blown out left and right. Like I'm not like, look, look, I'm going to show you this for today's pick them. Yeah. I'm using freaking dice, <laughs> dice to make decisions about these scores this week. Okay. Hey, you know, whatever works, you never know. You never know. So I just use vibes. There you go. Well, the vibes uh, have not been good here, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> got eight friggin' points and what you and Wes are neck and neck and 20 plus. Oh, man. All right, let's move to helmet stickers. Uh, Matt, uh, who are you handing out helmet stickers to this week? All right. So the first uh, helmet sticker I got is for and we do have stickers. You should check our merch. It's on yeah. whatever website Wes set up. Kudos to yeah, us. Um, yeah. It's in our yeah, thank you, Wes. Link yes, and it, check. Yeah, link it by. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. And turn on the notification bell and all that other YouTube stuff that people do. Anyway, helmet stickers. Yes, helmet stickers. Uh, I've Garrett Nussmeyer. I feel like he gets one. Uh, you know, thirty-two for forty-four, uh, three hundred fifty yards and three TDs against UCLA. And granted, it is UCLA, so keep that with a grain of salt. But I feel like that's that's worthy of a helmet sticker. Pretty good day for him. Uh, I'd also like to give a very large helmet sticker, and I'm being a little bit of a homer here, so don't don't come at me in the comments. Um, to Coach Heupel, I feel like Heupel and the coaching staff, this was a big win, uh, kind of getting Tennessee over that little bit of a hump that we've kind of been behind over the last couple of bits. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, Heupel is an Oklahoma alum. He led them to the national championship in 2000. He was runner-up for the Heisman that year. The guy was the OC there until he got fired back in 2012, question mark. Like, this was an emotional thing for him. He just lost his mom uh, in May. So, you know, there was a lot... There was a lot of emotion with this game. You could kind of tell from the way he was acting. And I've been saying it all year. Coach has got a different look in his eye. It's a different ball game for some reason. Um, and then, the obviously, the locker room talk at the end was very emotional. Uh, so definitely kudos to him and the coaching staff. And then I am giving away a third helmet sticker this week, uh, I, kind of breaking from, from this tradition. Um, and I'm, dare I say, I'm the FDR of pigskins and pageantry. Uh so I, I think Kirk Curb Street and needs a helmet sticker. And Kirk, if you're watching this, I'd like oh, to say man, thank you that. Um, for for doing doing your your duty uh, as a as a sports journalist to call some bullcrap when you see it. Um, because let's be frank here: when you've got these high octane offenses and they're flying around, and then people are just kind of flopping over. Uh, to, and again, I know that this is a sticky subject, uh, but when those little Injuries happen after, right after a first down, and the guy was literally walking around. With, like Kirk came out and said, "It's unethical as hell," quote unquote. Yeah. And I thought he was a hundred percent on the money. I really feel like more people need to talk about this issue. I feel like Greg Sankey needs to do something about this particular thing too. I don't know if we need to like keep a kid out for a quarter when that happens or what it is, but. Like there needs to be some sort of fix to this, and they need to do it sooner rather than later. Or they need to take acting classes because this is just embarrassing. You know what I mean? It's like, it is it's not, not good. It's obvious. It's not good. So obvious. Uh, uh, Jesse, your uh, helmet stickers. I'm only going to do one this week. Uh, I'll give my extra one to Matt so he can have it. There but appreciate I'm that. I'm going to give my helmet sticker to Arkansas. Dare That's I? Fair. Say Bobby Petrino? What? <laughs> Let me clutch my pearls. I oh, know. Man. Um, he's come in there and there's some, some offensive things happening for the Razorbacks. And like I said, they're leading um the country in third down conversion. So maybe with they've got some things to clean up. I'm not saying that, but beating Auburn at Jordan Hare is nothing to um sneeze at. So 
my helmet sticker goes to Bobby Petrino and Lord knows he needs to wear one while driving. Well, <laughs> we are used to offensive things from Bobby Petrino. So uh, not to mention, they've also got the number one running back in the league right now. And that's saying something when you look at the running backs in this league. Mm -hmm. It's true. So. Very true. Um, all right. So for my helmet stickers, I'm going to go with uh, Robbie Ashford first. Uh, just when, when you consider all that he's been through, I'm sure his confidence was rattled from his time at at Auburn. I mean, just being benched and then coming back and benched again, I think. And but and then just to put up the numbers that he did, even I know it's a lesser opponent in Akron. Uh, it's still impressive. He had uh, 243 yards in the air, two touchdowns, uh, over 100 yards on the ground, and another touchdown. I mean, that's that's still impressive. So. Kudos to the guy for for sticking with it. I was very impressed with that. And then my second sticker goes to the Tennessee offensive line. Uh, they made holes for, honestly, whoever was running the ball. I mean, you just pick a name out of a hat. And then they uh, wore down uh, Oklahoma's defensive line as the game went along, sort of set that tone for the game, I felt. Um, so, granted, it wasn't a blowout win, but they still kind of controlled the feel of that game. So. I don't feel like that score was really indicative of how far apart those teams were in that game. Because I would say it, that's think, a fair assessment, yeah. Because I, because Tennessee, or sorry, Oklahoma didn't score that last touchdown until the fourth quarter. Um, and that, that was like the first touchdown that Tennessee's defense had given up in like 19 straight quarters or something like that. Right, so. right. All right, well, that does it for helmet stickers for this week. And so right now we are going to get into a very special interview with a very special guest. We're absolutely thrilled to talk to this guy. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Well, we are absolutely thrilled about today's guest. So let's get right into it. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jesse to introduce today's special guest. I obviously could not come on the week with Alabama playing Georgia by myself. I felt like I needed some backup, um, especially if we're going to be an underdog. Come on, let's find Barely, come on. With it. Um, so I'm really excited to bring on Cruz Oxenrider, who I was thinking about it, and I was like, Cruz, how did we meet? We met at a place where all great connections start, a fraternity party. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to give yourself a much better introduction than that. But tell us about what you're currently doing and um, and a little bit more about your background with Bama. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure even being joined in the graces of a Georgia fan and a Tennessee fan. Uh, we did meet at a fraternity party. It was like a – if I'm not mistaken, I believe there was Whataburger involved. If, if I'm not, I think it was your first Whataburger <laughs> trip after a Halloween bonfire. It was not we a drove, short drive. Either. We drove all the way to Pelham, Alabama <laughs> randomly. And with me and another one of my really good friends and one of your friends. And then, yeah, we got, we got Whataburger at like midnight on a random yes. Wednesday. Great Halloween to be honest. But uh, yeah, so I, for those, who know, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, um, I, I make really good memes. At least I like to think so. Uh, for those who don't, you you probably know who I am from a different fan base and just hate me on social media, which is totally fine. Uh, but I live up in Chicago now. I'm originally from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, attended the University of Alabama. Uh, I go back and do things with the university, so I'll be back there this week speaking. I've done a few other different things. Uh, but I am just uh, another typical guy who loves college football, who somehow, some way, uh, got in the position I am because I make fun of everybody, including my own team and myself. So I'm not just a Bama homer. I, I think I make fun of the New Orleans Saints, which is my childhood team, more than anybody else possibly. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk some college football. Um, I can't believe we're already in week four. What is it? Five now? This is insane. I need wow. to slow down. <laughs> it's already October, almost. Almost October. Don't worry, we'll get there. I couldn't uh, not include a a third weekend in October question before we're getting out <laughs> of this interview. But you mentioned being from Mobile. Obviously, you went to university. But we always love to ask, how did your fandom start? I think for all of us, we were born into it. But yeah. how did yours start? So I have uh, most pe and most people know this too. I've been pretty open about it because I did not grow up an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan or anything like that. I actually grew up uh, a Florida Gator fan because my parents. I grew up a huge Gator. 
uh, in high school was like the peak of Florida football. Tim Tebow, Urban Meyer, Percy Harvin was great. Ended up uh, going to the University of Florida my freshman year and uh, just was not uh, a good fit for me. I uh, made some really good friends, still keep in touch with some of them. Uh, I go back to Gainesville every once in a while when I get a chance, uh, if I can. Um, but just wasn't a good fit for me. I went to high school in Alabama and I actually visited Alabama and Auburn. Uh, I, I enjoyed both schools, had really good friends and connections at both schools. And I actually, I made the wrong decision the first time picking myself. So I let fate pick for me. I flipped the coin, uh, 50, 50 shot landed on tails. Uh, so tails, Alabama heads was Auburn flip the coin, land on tails, apply the transfer the next day. And then the rest is history. I've been there since. And so there was a, a legit 50, 50 shot of me being a Barner. Oh my gosh. Thank wow. God fate stepped in. I mean, <laughs> and, and I will say too, I have, um, it, it, it was, a I gave both schools a fair shot, but Alabama was the best decision I ever made. Uh, great school of communications. Uh, the people I met, the fraternity brothers, the friends, the, like the, the like the countless memories I made, like will never be able to be replaced. I always tell people when, um, cause even in Chicago, I would have coworkers whose kids or cousins or somebody was, was thinking about Alabama and they'd ask me about it. And I always told them, if you don't want to go to Alabama, don't visit Yeah, because the moment you visit, you're going. Well, that's, that's what happened to my sister. My, they, yep. my parents would not let my sister go visit Alabama me, and she, funny enough, I told her to go visit. She was set on going to some school up north. I told her to go visit Ole Miss because Ole Miss would have, was another school that I loved and I thought I had a great time. She went there within an hour of her visit. She's like, I'm going to school here. Same thing would happen if she would have won to Bama, though. Yep, absolutely. I think that's something really special about these big SEC schools. You get on campus and there's just a feeling there. There's all of those traditions. There's all of the pageantry and they're beautiful campuses. Yeah. They really do just envelop you in, um, feel like your family, you get there, like there's the spark and there's something you want to be a part of. And I think that's that's pretty consistent across most SEC schools. Um, it is. Which- and I think too, is like being up in big 10 country right now, being in the Midwest, like I've, I've had a chance to go to East Lansing. I've gone to Madison, uh, you know, a week ago, which uh, I will say some of the nicest fans I've met, they're great, great time. Uh, done Ann Arbor. Done Northwestern, done some really done some other games. You can't replicate what the SEC is. I think the I think the closest you could probably get would probably be like a Nebraska, um, mm. which I give them more. I think they're original Big Twelve and Big Ten and, and every time. And then I would say Ohio State's up there too. I, I went to a game in the Big House uh, a few years ago, and it was really cool. It was very unique. It was cool. Uh, they they were playing Michigan State. They were blowing them out. Um, but it just didn't feel like an SEC. It didn't feel like I was at like a Death Valley or or an Athens or a Knoxville or a Tuscaloosa. Like it just didn't feel. It didn't even feel like Jordan Hare. It just it didn't. It it was something. It was missing something. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely the humidity. Which God bless you <laughs> yes. Um the the early September games are not for the weak. Um, They're not. Toxic. They build character. Hydrate, children. Hydrate. Um, but I think obviously the big game of this yeah. upcoming week is Alabama versus Georgia Yeah, being originally from Georgia. Mm-hmm. This is, this is special yeah. uh, because Georgia fans growing up just uh, weren't always nice to me, but that's okay. And I don't love barking, but <laughs> I digress. So obviously for me growing up there, there was a little bit of, of hatred with UGA just because I was surrounded by them and I wasn't part of it. But what are your thoughts on what I feel like is somewhat of a a newer or reinvigorated rivalry? Because they are in our fight song. Uh, but how do you feel about this new kind of back and forth between UGA and Bama? You, you know, I think the the best way to describe it is iron sharpens iron. Uh, I feel like since I would say Kirby got to to Georgia, so I, in, excluding 2016, that was his first year. So it's like. With 2007, I exclude Saban's first year. Didn't have a lot of his guys in. And then same with Kirby in 2016. I'd say since 2017, the gold standard right now in the SEC, besides one year with LSU, which, uh, it, it, you know, which was a great, it was a great team. But we're the, they're the two gold standards in the SEC. Uh, now with the division's gone, it, it really is, you know, 
those two can meet, play multiple times. Uh, I, I think is a heavyweight fight. This is this is something that you love about college football. You want the best games. You want the best teams playing each other. Not at the end of the season, but you kind of want to see a round two. Like I didn't. I and it's not where you can see him again in the playoffs. Like in 2011 uh, when we were there. Like you know LSU goes into Bama, beats them. Great game. And you can make the argument that we didn't deserve to be in the BCS championship because of Oklahoma State because people didn't want to see that matchup again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Luckily, we did because the better team won. Uh, Back in 2021, you saw Bama beat down Georgia in the in the SEC championship, and then you know they get the they get the luck of the draw again, and they get to play Bama a second time uh, Mm -hmm. when it mattered the most. I would rather see us play two once in the regular season, and then maybe one more in Atlanta. And then the that's a that's a do or die game for the loser again. Um, I, I think this is going to be a fantastic game. The atmosphere is going to be incredible. It's probably the hardest ticket to get in college football in the last ten years. Um, I think I saw something today. Uh, national championship ticket uh, from like Georgia versus TCU were cheaper than uh, than this than this game right now. It, it's going to be insane. Yeah, I believe. It. I mean, I think that was the same. <laughs> A couple of years back when we we didn't go to the national championship and we had played georgia and it was like you couldn't buy those tickets no uh, at, no, at the, all. no was it, you're about the notre dame national yeah. championship yeah. i only reason i got one i got a student ticket and i got offered by this notre dame guy there's there's and i'll give him dedication for this because he ended up getting one uh he was standing outside the line and every person who was coming to pick up their ticket he would ask and he had like a thousand dollars in cash uh, asking people, I said no because this was like my first national championship game to go as a student. So I was like, no chance I'm I'm doing this. But like I, I think like a few people walked past me and the someone ended up folding, and uh, he got one. But and he sat in. I remember seeing him. He sat in the Alabama student section. He left after the first quarter when we were up twenty one nothing. That's fair. That's fair. Oh, yeah. I mean, I commend him on. That's a good strategy. I hadn't thought of it. I I didn't have a thousand dollars to to no. spend the student. Absolutely. No, so. absolutely not. <laughs> but no, I, but in all honesty, I think this all eyes are going to be on this game. I know there's some other slates, uh, you know, going on, but this is the one game everyone has had circled on their calendar since it got announced. I know Michigan, Texas was going to be a draw. Georgia, Texas in a few weeks going to be big. Everyone loves Ohio State, Michigan, or, or, or Oregon, Ohio State. This is the game that you could ask any college football fan where they want to be this weekend, and they're going to say Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Absolutely. And I think another aspect of it is it's Coach DeBoer's first time playing a program of this magnitude, not only a program of this magnitude, but one that's within the conference and one that Coach Saban won against and lost against. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that extra layer of anticipation just to see how Coach DeBoer leads the team against Kirby Smart. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing too is is that there you could flip it and say this is the one team that Kirby Smart, in, since he's been at Georgia, just can't beat. He he just can't. And he and it and people are gonna be like, oh, he got him in the natty. Yeah, if you look at that game, Mechie's Luke goes down second quarter of the SEC championship game, and Jamison Williams is well on his way to over 180 yards receiving uh, before he goes down in the second quarter. Um, and you got Slade Bolden as your wide receiver one. No offense to Slade, he's a friend of mine, but like you go from Mechie and J-Mo to Slade Bolden and Aji Hall, uh, who couldn't get separated whatsoever. Um, Georgia, I, now, and I want to see, is it was it a Nick Saban problem with Kirby Smart or is it an Alabama problem? Because then it then you, if, you know, Georgia goes into Alabama and let's just say they lose by 10, you're going to get people saying, what the hell is going on with Kirby in this thing? Is it the yips when he plays it and he sees the when he sees the crimson A? Or, you know, maybe he's had the luxury of playing in the weak SEC East since he's gotten there. And now the talent's catching up because now you got to worry about teams in the division. There are no more divisions. I ain't got to worry about Ole Miss. Tennessee's no joke this year. Uh, you got you got Texas now. I think Oklahoma is still a few years away recruiting, but I mean they're not going to be a slouch anymore either. So it's good. It's a very, I think this game is actually more important for Georgia than it is Alabama. Uh, and I, and I've, and I've said that since the season, because I, I think Kirby has all the pressure in the world saying, if I can't be Alabama without Nick Saban, 
I'm going to have to deal with this guy for another decade plus because DeBoer's not going anywhere either. He's young. He he's I mean, he, and he's and he's building a giant recruiting. Uh, I don't even think he's got his full offense in play yet. I think next year with Ty and Russell coming in, we're going to see a lot more Washington than we are seeing Bama uh, offensively in the next couple of years. Yeah, I would agree. And I think there's also that that layer of say Alabama does lose. Then yeah. you say, well, it's a new coach. You know, yeah. we're still trying to get the the rhythm. There's not definitely a- more expectation on Georgia than Alabama yeah, exactly. at this point. Exactly. Now, Bama fans will still be in an uproar if we lose. Oh yeah, if that wrong. But there is that. Okay, we're settling in. You know, whereas Kirby, he's he's been at the helm. This isn't new for him. But speaking of Coach DeBoer, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think he is settling in thus far at Bama. It's certainly a new era. It's certainly something that um, obviously my heart hurt. Um, yeah. we're, we're getting through it and I think he's doing a great job, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to be at a day and I was lucky enough to be at the first game of the DeBoer era. Um, you can definitely feel a little bit of a different energy uh, there. And, and, that, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I think, I think the one thing towards the end of Saban's run, especially in the NIL era, is that players had a lot more freedom, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more choices as far as like where they could go. They're dictating a playing time. Uh, You know, they can control a lot more. And I'm not saying that Saban never had control because he definitely did. I mean, you still have to get the guys in and and build in and, you know, buy into the culture. But I also think at the end of the day, the boar is embracing that NIL era and he's embracing that younger culture. It, it's, he's just a little more relatable. That's why you got a guy like Courtney Morgan. I think Courtney Morgan right now is probably the most uh, underappreciated uh, college football employee. I've gotten a chance to talk to him and I I got to pick the guy's brain and, and he genuinely loves and gets and understands not just football, but he gets the culture of everything. Mm -hmm. He gets these kids. These kids will love him. I've seen him pitch on a day uh, to a kid and I'm not going to name the recruit, uh, but I watched him. I was like, damn, I want to go suit up for this guy. I mean, he's incredible wherever he would go. I I would go play for him. Um, And I think he's doing a really good job. I think he's doing as good as job as you can, you can ask for replacing a guy like Nick Saban. I mean, I think I'll be, I I was very upfront and honest. I thought there were three people uh, you call for the job. Uh, originally when Saban retired, I said Dan Lanning, D'Amico, Rines, and Lane Kiffin. Uh, and, and Sarkeesian in there, but I never thought Sark was going to leave Texas. I, I think, think, he, was leave. I think he, he's got he's got it all. The only reason I thought Dan Lanning is he's young, he's a Saban guy, he's coached in the SEC before, and and I just love the energy he kind of brings. Uh, D'Amico Ryans was a you know like a wild card, you know like a hell mary because he's got a great thing going in the NFL, but he's a Bama guy. He's well respected in the com- uh, coaching community. And I think recruiting wise, we wouldn't miss a step. In fact, I actually think it would have been really good for it. And then Lane, just because I love chaos, I really do, and I love the Lane train. And I but I never the stories I've been told about Lane with the with the boosters and everything. It's just I I don't see it happening ever and which I hate because I think Lane is I think he's a top five coach in college football and I and I can debate that with a lot of people uh building what he's built but I when Kalen DeBoer got put into the circle I was like man I I just don't know I know he's a great coach and I mean what he did at Washington is nothing that you know sneeze at but I was just a little worried how he come in and then he didn't miss a beat uh, I mean, getting Ryan Williams back, getting these guys uh, to buy into the culture. He did great in the transfer portal. LT Overton's a freak. Uh, what we got with Saab at Michigan, yeah. uh, the guys we're bringing in next year. I mean, it, getting getting guys like Womack uh, to, to leave a head coaching job in college football to come be a defensive coordinator. I mean, things like that like are being overlooked, and I think he's building something special here. I think – not this year. This year, I, I think as long as he holds the ship steady, and and I and I never expected to go perfect this season. If we do, incredible. Um, but I, but being realistic in this, the next two years is where I'm like, okay, Ryan Williams is a sophomore. He's got a five star quarterback coming in. He's got Ty Simpson, a fifth year guy coming in, probably going to take the realms next year. Um, 
you know, Jam Miller and, and Justice will be another year older. I, I feel like the next two years is where he's like, all right, this is the DeBoer Alabama. But so far, so good. I mean, I got to give it an A. He's done fantastic. He's he he the ship looked like it was sinking worse than the Titanic. And he's kept the thing afloat, which I will say, and you know this too, going to school there, Alabama fans, we've been spoiled for the last like better half of, of two decades. It, it's It's been like that. And it's not the younger generation's fault that they're coming into this, but seeing it from the outside, like I remember when Saban got hired in 07 and they lost to Louisiana Monroe as a non-Alabama fan. I'm like, wow, this is bad. And then the next year, boom, it, it it's happening. So um, I give it an A. I, I, I could also make the case for a B plus if, if you're worried about in-state recruiting, but I'm not because I've seen Bama and Nick Saban and those guys get guys from California and Texas and everything like that. We're going to be fine. Yeah, I agree. I, I wanted lane. I'm not going to lie. I thought, I think lane has settled he is. well into a head coaching position since being at Ole Miss. I think before I was a little torn, I thought maybe he's just a coordinator. He needs a head coach to kind of keep him on the straight and narrow, but I think he's really grown as a coach at Ole Miss and I would have yeah. loved to see him back. I was unsure about DeBoer, but I'm feeling better. I, I feel like I agree. Maybe in the next couple of years, we're going to start to see some really big moves. And I'm almost okay with people not fully realizing it yet. Like, let's let's do our work behind the curtain, and then we'll come out and show everybody and surprise them. Uh, but we're not missing a step on the main stage right now. So I'm certainly happy with that. Speaking of some of our our big recruits and players that he's gotten in, the players he's kept in the program, who do you think is the Alabama player to watch out for this season? Who's the guy you're watching? I've said it since he's uh, since he's been on the scene it's from my hometown in Sarah Lane, Alabama. Ryan Williams is the kid. The kid's incredible. I, I think he's literally the next a kid. <laughs> I think he's he's. I know the, the people are being beat to death with. He's only 17 years old. This kid could have been 16 and still been doing this stuff. He's been doing it since he's since he's been young. Great kid. Um, had a chance. We've talked a few times over the years via social media just because he's a Sarah Lane kid. And, you know, I've always rooted for the kid. Even when he decommitted from Bama, I, I, I messaged him and I said, hey, man, no matter where you go, I know you're going to tear it up. Best of luck. And then we came back. I was ecstatic. That was, that was so important, not just for DeBoer, but for the but for the program, keeping a guy like that to not only still who had so many opportunities, he could have gone to Auburn, could have gone to AM, could have gone to Texas. I mean, he could have gone anywhere he wanted, and he stayed because he realizes that he can be kind of like what Julio was to Saban. Yeah. I'm, now you can make the case, you know, maybe Julio is he's a top ten all time Saban player, but you can make the case he's the most important. Uh, Ryan Williams has a chance to be the most important and the best under DeBoer. He's got these guys, uh, you know, hyped. He's having fun. I mean, the guy is going out there and making it look easy. I mean, I, I was sitting next to a Wisconsin fan and saying this guy should be getting ready for homecoming, not not scoring touchdowns on us. I mean, the kid, <laughs> the kid true. is, the kid's just got an unbelievable energy about him. He carries himself like a professional. Um. I, I will say this year, if you're looking from a transfer standpoint, guys who came in, LT Overton, I thought was probably one of the best things we could have got. The kid, the kid's a freak. He was the number one player in high school coming out. I, you know, I thought he got too much money coming out of AM and m and, and Jimbo. That thing was just a dumpster fire. And I feel like they never used him correctly. We got him all over the field. He's knocking quarter, quarterbacks out. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be a big part in this Georgia game as well. Cause I think their offensive line is probably I'd say where we would have a little bit of a slight edge. And yeah. I think, and I think right now Saab has been a great addition too. I was, you know, losing a guy like Caleb Downs and it sucks because yeah. he was such a great player and he could have been all time great here, but Saab has been in, he's done great in the system for us. And I think he's been doing good, but I mean, how can it not be Ryan? Ryan, Ryan is, he's gotta be the story. Or at least like one of the best wide receivers right now, uh, freshman wise behind, I got like uh, Smith at Ohio State. Yep. Uh, I mean, it, things like that, but he's incredible. And I think for we're going to have to enjoy him because we know when it, after his junior year, he's gone. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I I wouldn't blame him a bit. Go no. go get paid. Go get paid. Go, Don't go get paid. Go 
go be in a New Orleans Saint. Go go win my team a Super Bowl, please. Like that would be fantastic. <laughs> we'll take him up in New England. We need all the help we can get. Um, yes. <laughs> he'll go any. Honestly, at this rate, he might be going to the Panthers. God bless him. Um, <laughs> they're trying really hard. Oh. But one player we have talked a lot about thus far is Jalen Milrow. Roll yes. Tad. Um, <laughs> there there have been talks. On this show in particular, we think the Heisman is stupid, but Mm -hmm. it is a big deal. Useless piece of metal. So people have said Milrow might be a top contender for Heisman. He finished pretty high in the votes last year. What are your thoughts on that? Finished six. uh, Probably was, I would say, I would say him and Blake Corum towards the end of last year were the best two players in college football after the the midway stretch at the LSU game. <clears throat> I, I think Tommy Reese is like, look, I am holding this kid back. I'm just going to let this kid do him. And what do you go out and do against LSU? He had four touchdowns on the ground. Couldn't stop him. Um, th- J- look, I, I will be the first one to him. And I even admitted this last year. I thought this kid was just not a good quarterback. I I didn't I thought he was a fantastic athlete, great kid, great human being. I've heard nothing but good things about the guy. But clearly there were just some there were some reserves about him because you know he couldn't read defenses or he's holding on the ball too long and not being comfortable enough running and I, and coming to the realization now there's more Tommy Reese and the yeah. lack of a good offensive line last year more than anything. Uh this year has been thinner. I think this like this has been it's been proof uh having a center who can actually get the ball to you having a, a good, you know, an offensive line who can actually give you time to read your, your second and third read, uh, having a good running game with Jim Miller and justice Haynes, having a coordinator who actually believes in your ability to, to throw the ball. Look at that throw that he had to Bernard in, in the Wisconsin. That was a dot Insane. to the quarter of the end zone. And yeah, you can say like, all oh, all he can do is throw the go route and this and that. No, if you go back and watch some of the throws he's doing, it's very vanilla right now on purpose. We're not showing a lot. We Our first three games, I feel like we have held back the playbook a mm. lot. Like, it's been very vanilla. There haven't mm. been any trick plays. There haven't been any, like, oh, wow, that was that was crazy. I've never seen that before. Look out for this week. I think Milrow is going to have a party. Yeah. I think he knows that his legs are, are his best weapon, and I, I think Kirby knows that as well. I expect him to have a spy on him, maybe even two at all times. And his arm is going to be what has to get it done. I think Milro has a chance this week. And I, here's the thing, too. I, I, I've never been the biggest Heisman guy because I've seen guys who have won who shouldn't have and vice versa. I think if Milro goes out and puts on a show like we know he can, you got to shoot him up, number one. I mean, right now, I think I think – I think the I think the quarterback winner of this game solidifies himself up in a in a in a top spot right now because if Carson Beck goes out and does the same, you know lights it up you got to put him number one I think Travis Hunter right now has mm. to be number one the way he's been playing on both sides of yeah. the ball but Jalen Milrow has a chance to put a vice grip on that thing and still Tennessee in a in a few weeks. Yeah, I agree. I will ask one more question, then I'll let the the guys jump in just because yeah. <laughs> as as you know I can talk Alabama football. Yeah. All day long um, until I'm blue in the face. But the big story overall in the past couple of years has been NIL mm-hmm. and the transfer portal. That's what everybody talks about. That's what, you know, older school coaches say is killing college football. That's what players are advocating for is helping them. What are your thoughts on NIL and the transfer portal? So I, I like the NIL. I've worked in it. Um, I got, I've worked in it for two years. Uh, I got, got a chance to, to work under Tim Tebow's NIL company for two years. And, and, you know, I, I think it's fantastic for not only just the guys that finally get paid their money, but not, but the other guys as well, like the rest of the team. I, I think if you're out there and even the practice squad guys and the third stringers and the guys who never really get to see the field, they can make a little bit of money and college football do it. I, I don't think it is as divisive as everyone thinks it is. It's a lot of old heads talking if you really think about it. But if you look at the back, if you look, if you're actually in the <laughs> if you're in the thick of things and you actually get to see the benefits it does on a personal level, it's fantastic. Not to mention it it also 
we can put the rest like, oh, they've been paying for players for years. Bama's been buying Dodge Chargers, yada, yada, yada. Oh, please. Like, Tennessee fans used to get uh, – Tennessee used to get uh, McDonald's bags full of money. That happened Tennessee. one time. One time one that time. you know of. So, I mean, let's, let's be real. I But, again, it, it is – it's good for it's good for the sport, but I do think at the end of the day there needs to be a little bit more control of things. I think there needs to be a little bit of a cap uh, on ma- rather it be by school or conference or or just pow- or power four now maybe power five. However, they're going to do it when the Pac twelve you know puts itself back together. I mean, there does need to be a little bit of control because Oregon and Ohio State basically paid for their teams this year. Uh, yeah. Oregon has an unlimited amount of money with Phil Knight and and um, and Nike. <clears throat> Ohio State I rumored to pay over twenty million dollars for their team this year, and if they don't win it, I'm gonna laugh because it's like congratulations, you lost with an NFL roster that you paid for, and you still couldn't get it done. Um, as far as a transfer portal goes, I don't mind it, but that one is the one I think that needs to be fixed desperately. There needs so the, the two things I would do to fix the transfer portal. There is a one transfer portal per kid that you don't have to sit out for. One, you get one. I don't care if the coach gets fired. I don't care if you know you get there and you're like, I made a terrible mistake. I'm you're sitting out a year unless yeah. unless it is a extreme emergency. Rather it be for a family member who's sick or uh, in, like those means. Totally yeah. get it. Um. But that would be the one. I would also say the transfer portal begins the week after the college football playoffs. Uh, Now they have this crazy thing where it's going to be the week before the college football playoffs start, which is absolutely insane. The fact that you're going to have coaches who are trying to recruit, get these kids, who's quitting on the team, who's not. Um, And that, and that window is open for two weeks. Uh, You get, you give them the, you basically until, until full signing day. And I, I would also get rid of, early signing day too because i think early signing day is killing college football a little bit um i think it's watering it down i think it, that's also going to hurt the transfer portal as well so you're either going to have to pick one or the other you're either going to keep early signing day and have a later transfer portal window or vice versa it's yeah. going to be the move because if you're in high school what if you get what if you're a four star and you're like man I, i'm going to nebraska i'm going to get playing time this year and then you get like oh you know what this five star the former five star receiver is coming to nebraska that kid's never going to touch the field uh, for at least two or three years, so you got to give her, you got to give and take a little bit with it. Um, but I think right now, college football, they're trying way too hard to be like the NFL, and it's been hurting the product a little bit the last couple of years. But granted, I think I love college football more than I love the NFL, and a lot of people will feel that way too. But the more and more that it is changing, like the two minute warning, uh, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if they change the kickoff rule in the next two years, depending uh, yeah. on how it goes. Uh, it, it's going to get dangerously close to uh, to being the NFL pi- or like basically feeder league where y- you might as well just like sign them off the practice squad of Alabama and Georgia and Ohio state instead of go to the draft. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's untrue. I think, I think the transfer portal certainly has the, the ability to cause more yeah. locker room division than, than NIL does. Um, and, and there's just so much uncertainty about players. There's so much that coaches have to contend with when it comes to, well, I'll just transfer. Well, if you look at what Lane has done at Ole Miss, Lane is like, you know what? I'm I'm going to win through the transfer portal. And I know I can. And look, he's done great. I mean, this, yeah. this, I mean, he, he's fully embraced it. I mean, sure. Yeah. They, they've brought in some, some high school guys, but he knows that he can win through the transfer portal. And then you look at guys like Florida teams like Florida State, where they're trying to mix the young and a recruiting class with all those transfer portal guys, and it is just not meshed. Like guys like Roy Dell Williams, DJ, Malik Benson, uh, some of the guys they've gotten as well. I mean, they are a divided, broken locker room. You can clearly tell that it's just not working. That Florida State team last year was the perfect mix of built in culture mm-hmm. of Tallahassee with a little bit of recruiting and transfer portal, but this year it just seems like they're putting gasoline with water. It's just not working at all. And and that's the danger of the transfer portal. Now you have to either be all in with the transfer portal. And I think you have to be like an 80, 20 split on each one where it's like, 
we're going to get 80% of our guys in recruiting or the transfer portal and then switch it up with the other 20. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. The transfer portal is, I have a lot of feelings on it. I think it just overall from a player development perspective, your programming, if you're working in athletics has to change drastically every year. And that just puts such a burden on the staff. Um, I understand kids wanting to go play where they feel like they have the best fit. If you lose your coach, that's got it. I mean, that sucks. You can't do anything yeah. with that. You want to go somewhere with the person who recruited you. I get that. But Wes, what was the Georgia quarterback's name that went to like four schools? Um, JT Daniels. JT Daniels, right? JT yeah. Daniels. That's ridiculous. And then had to <laughs> medically absurd. retire from football after all that. Yeah, so, that's yeah. absurd to me. Um, but with all that being said, Matt and Wes, I will open it up to you. I know I've monopolized most of the questions and in, in the conversation, <laughs> so I will, I will be quiet for a while. Uh, well, Cruz, to uh, truth be told, um, between family and friends, uh, I am exposed to Alabama fandom probably about a thousand percent more than other fandoms. So uh, <laughs> I don't have a ton of questions, but I do have a uh, kind of a uh, just for fun question: is uh, yep. what is what is your favorite Bama football moment that you've experienced, whether it be in person or or watching on TV? And it's okay if you say second and 26. I'll, I'll be it's, all right with that. So I, don't get me wrong. <laughs> second and 26 was a great memory. Um, me personally was it was probably the year after the uh, the SEC championship game with Jalen Milrow because you can't write a better script than that. That was I can't wait for that 30 for 30. Um, I know 2018 didn't exactly end the way we want to, especially with the cleansing game. That team by the end of it was just broken uh, physically. But man, t- to go into that game, the team you beat the year before comes out and just starts. Sl- Georgia punched us in the mouth for three quarters. I mean, yeah. they did. Um, Tua was clearly hurt. Uh, you know, having clearly the worst game of his career goes out, throws two terrible interceptions in the red zone and everything like that. And then he gets hurt in the fourth quarter. We're down 10 um, or no, I'm sorry, not 10, but seven. And then hits Waddle the next game or next play drive gets, gets hurt. Jalen hurts the guy he replaced in the same dome, almost a full calendar year later comes in off the bench and leads your team to victory. Uh, in a, in a in a in a game I've never seen Coach Saban be emotional for, but even Coach Saban at the end of that of that of that game where he got interviewed, choked up talking about Jalen Hurts and how proud he was. That was probably being in Atlanta for that was probably the most goose. Like I I got goosebumps now, like talking about it. I think that one will forever be one of the best moments in Alabama football history, even in the Saban era. Uh, that's not a national championship. Um, but as far as fun goes, like beating Notre Dame in 2012 was just incredible. <laughs> I've uh, I, that was probably just the most obnoxious fun I've ha- ever had going to Miami with a bunch of friends. Never been around Notre Dame fans before. And we get there and we're, you know, we got an RV, we're tailgating. We're trying to invite Notre Dame fans, to, you know, like, hey, like, do you guys want a beer? We're cooking out. They're calling us rednecks, telling us to go back to the trailer park, saying that our RVs are nicer than where we than where we live, and things. I'm like, wow, these guys suck. And so I go into the game. It's twenty one nothing first quarter. My friends who didn't go to the game who were at the tailgate said they're packing their car, their RVs up, and they're leaving. And man, it was beautiful. A lot of them left some of their stuff behind. We found some of their signs they had. We're taking pictures with them. <laughs> but I mean, I like I said, I I came into I've been very spoiled as a college football fan going from Spurrier. I had Tebow. I I, I refuse to give Urban Meyer acknowledgement. I think he's a terrible human being. Um, and then uh, and then being and then transferring to Alabama and you know being able to go to you know, have the greatest college football coach of all time since I've gotten there. And it's been great. Those are two moments. I remember exactly where I was. Yeah. Those yeah. moments. Um, For the Natty in 2012, we, I was in Tuscaloosa, but we were watching it. We started celebrating in the streets at halftime. And then we went to the bar at halftime. It was on in the background, but at that point, it you, really didn't matter. You could tell in like the first two or three drives of that game, where you, it was one of those deals where you're looking around like, "Uh oh, this is about to get out of hand real fast." It just so. it, it went on to prove the overhypeness 
of Notre Dame that still continues, mind yeah. you. I think um, most of us knew in the SEC championship that year that that was the true championship. Even, no, at, even at the time, we were like, this is it. 100%. That was maybe one of the best games I've ever watched. Um, that game was an instant classic. It really yeah. was. I mean, you guys would have done the exact same thing to Notre Dame that we did. Todd Gurley probably runs for 250 that game, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, that was that was the only one that I had. Matt, did you have anything? Uh yeah. So, you know, just a couple of, of current um headlines in the SEC this week. Just wanted to kind of get your take real quick, Chris. <laughs> so uh you're the new athletic director at Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who gets Billy's job? I uh, go back in the time machine and get Prime Will or uh, C Spurrier if I could. Mm. Um, realistically, there there's only a few calls you can make that can fix this mess. I think the first call you make is Lane Kiffin, but I don't think Lane goes. I don't. Go. I don't. I don't think he does. It, look, I I know what the expectations are of that of that university. I have friends who work in the athletic department there. Recruiting is yes, recruiting is great, but now in, in in the NIL era, it's not the same anymore. Miami can outspend you. Florida State's got a good, uh, has a good program. UCF is even recruiting well. Uh, mm-hmm. They're stealing guys uh, with that with that NASA money. I mean, look, it, <laughs> it, it is tough right now to be in Gainesville. I don't think it's that great of a job anymore. It used to be a great job. Not I never the- thought that. I never thought they should have got rid of Dan Mullen. I think Dan Neither Mullen, does Dan Mullen based on his uh, right. no, he's yeah. hilarious. You went from being finishing second in the East, maybe and sometimes first. You guys used uh, they used to give Georgia a run for their money. Yeah. Um, they were putting up great offensive numbers. I never thought Anthony Richardson was or, or not Anthony Richardson, Emory Jones was the guy. But if you would have given Dan Mullen Anthony Richardson, I would have loved it, would have seen what that offense would have been like. And mm-hmm. they and they canned him. And look, Billy is just he's a coordinator or a small t- or a small job. I I didn't like him when he was at Louisiana Lafayette. He played in way too many close games um against inferior competition. I think Anthony Richardson's the only reason he beat some of the teams he did a few years ago. That that's a broken team. It's a broken locker room. I, and I hate saying that cuz I know he's a good guy, but you got you got to you got to make a big splash on this one. And and, and I hate saying this you got to go do everything you can to go get Urban Meyer back. I fully mean that. You go get you you make a call to Urban and you bring him back. That as much as a terrible human being he is, he is arguably one of the top best uh, college football coaches of all time. The guy came in and rebuilt your program once. He can do it again. He he is just the only guy who could come in. And you'll give that leash to for a few years, but he'll he'll build you a program. Like Kirby Smart does not want to have to is glad that the divisions are gone if he comes in and you don't have to play him every year, because Florida is a sleeping giant that needs that kind of that menace that villain to come fill the role. Dion can't do it. I don't think Dion could could handle that job. No. I don't think Lane wants it. Um, I I don't know if there's another big name that you can go get right now in college football that would take that job. I go get urban. He's done it once before he's done it at Ohio state. I think he could do it again, but you're just going to have to be like, Hey, like we know we sold our soul to the devil to get this guy. <laughs> yeah. But championships or morals is what Florida is going to have to do. And let's be real. Like they, it's not the first time they picked this. So uh, that's supposedly Maybe he's... Ted Lasso. I think he might be able to fix Florida. I wouldn't want Ted Lasso there. Ted Lasso is too pure. I don't want to ruin Ted. <laughs> Ted Lasso with uh, Urban Meyer as the assistant coach. <laughs> well, supposedly, he said he's not coming because he's, you know, um, I forget he, was, he, uh, what he show also it was on. Said he before. said he's not coming back. Look, but yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. He's, he said a lot of things. So who uh, Urban, Meyer, Urban Meyer retired because he was he missed his family, wanted to spend time with his family, took a job at college game day where he traveled more and was gone more coaching football, and then the next year took the Ohio State job. I don't <laughs> trust a single word out of that guy's mouth. I never have. It's valid. Uh, if you, if you guys it. haven't yet, go check out the new Aaron Hernandez thing on FX. The, the person who they got to play Urban Meyer, I think is the perfect, like, Perfect representation Sleaze. of what that guy Sleazy. is. His, look, I worked for Tebow when they made that Swamp Kings documentary. That was a fluff piece. There was so much that was cut out of that show. 
uh, of that thing. And, it, and and I loved him to death. I think he genuinely is the greatest human being I've ever met. And I, I will go down to my grave saying that. It is hard for me to comprehend how a guy that great can can work with a person that awful. Yeah, I think that, and we we had a um, a Florida podcast on a few weeks ago, and we were asking that. I was like, "How do you get Urban Meyer, Tim Tebow, Aaron Hernandez, Brandon Spikes all in a locker room and Riley Cooper? It works. Yeah, Riley twins. <laughs> um, I'm yep. trying to think who else. Chris Rainey who. Assault. So my freshman year at Florida, Chris Rainey assaulted his girlfriend. Um, yep. Will Hill and 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 Ahmad Black committed credit card fraud. Um, Carlos Dunlap got so drunk the night or the week before the SEC championship game and fell asleep in a Taco Bell drive through. Um, I mean that team is was. I, I know we give Georgia a lot of crap now, but that team is like that is the definition of felony. You. <laughs> they they were pinnacle. Yes. <laughs> Matt, I need you to ask your other question that you've written here because I've been watching you type. <laughs> uh, so another big thing, and we talked about it earlier in the episode. Uh, Missouri uh, <laughs> had a little bit of an off week. Uh, is is <laughs> is Missouri mid, or is this just an example of them just coming out of the gate struggling a little bit? No, I look. I, it would be one thing if it was like Kentucky or. Hell, I'll even give them Florida. They they're, they mid, they look they look they look warm. That was the correct like, answer. Thank they're you, like Chris. if you go to Taco Bell the night after a bar and you forget to eat it, and then the next day you put it in the microwave. Oh, oh no, that's it's like that. Idea. That team is that team is ro- coasting off of the hype, and they were a fantastic. They were a great team last year. They were a great story. I thought they were a much better team. They are not nearly as good as they were last year. Now, don't get me wrong. Luther Burden is that dude, and I think Cook is a, is a good college quarterback. But if you let Vanderbilt take you to double overtime at home, and just because I, just because they they whiffed on a on a field goal, that I, you you let that go to multiple overtimes after the second one and two point conversion plays, you're lucky to walk out of that with a win. Mm-hmm. Um, wait, Bam, they have to come to Tuscaloosa in a couple of weeks, and. I mean, and, and I don't, I don't even know what the rest of their schedule is to be honest. But like, I would it's be worried. easy. It's super it's so easy. Toilet paper. Easy. Stupid, easy. They Man. very well could back their way into the playoff if they, they have could. losses. If they total. do, if they do, they will get boat raced. If they play <laughs> yeah. anywhere near they did the way they did against Vandy, like I, like I look forward. Like I think that could be a game where, like hypothetically, like. If say for example, like you know, Georgia beats uh, Alabama this week, and you have these games where it's like, then they play Vandy, then they play you know uh, Tennessee, and then they get then they get Missouri. Man, he might Milro might throw for four hundred against Missouri. I mean, he might he might bomb it. Ryan I, Williams, I would I have as, as a Tennessee fan, I would love to see Missouri in the first round of the playoffs. Oh, and same. I saw, I saw somebody put that on Twitter. A couple weeks ago, yes, Twitter, not X West. We'll talk about that again in a second. <laughs> yes, um, I'll never call it. X. The uh, I saw somebody put that graphic up, and in the first round it was a home game for Tennessee against Missouri, and I was just salivating. I was like, mm. "Oh, please, you for would, the love of God, Tennessee fans would make drinking tea cry." Like, oh, actually, I would, oh, I would enjoy that so much. There's I, enough I, wagon circling. I mean, look, I'll say this right now: I think the the five seed of the playoffs honestly has a better road or path to a national championship than getting a first round bye. Um yeah. cuz they're going in they're playing the 12 seed they're get they get their legs fresh. I think that I think a team who gets a first round bye this this year is going to get upset. Yeah. Uh so I would rather go into that game fresh, get your legs warm against that that uh group of 4 group of 5 team the week before cuz I saw something Bama was playing uh I think Fresno State. If I'm not mistaken it was so, it was no it wasn't Fresno State it was somebody. And I'm like, you get Bama a Tuscaloosa home game against that team at five. Oh, I'll take that all day. I would rather that than the bye week. The bye weeks make me nervous. I don't like it. There's bad juju there. You get comfortable. More time you get for people sick. to get in trouble. Yeah, I don't like that. Mm-mm. Especially, Mm-mm. especially if they have to drive to class, right, Wes? Hey, good one, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can make the sense. as a Tennessee fan, I can make those jokes because we never get in trouble for anything. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. 
<laughs> my dog is rolling on the floor. I'm sorry if you can hear. Um, but I think my last question crew for let you go is probably the most important question. We always ask, where is the place in your college town that is the best place to go for a game? Obviously, if you're not going into the game, um, I have my answer. I hope it's the same for you, but best place in Tuscaloosa to watch a game other than Bryant Denny Sa- Bryant Denny Stadium. I mean, say they they field at Bryant Denny Stadium. They field at Bryant Denny Stadium. I'm getting there. It's look, it's new. I, I I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Uh so I'm I'm a little biased here. I I have two answers. So obviously, uh in its free Irish pub is home sweet home to me. I love that bar. I've loved it since college. It'll always be my go-to. Irish cold wings, uh grilled Pub fries and a sabinade uh, with a with a car bomb to top it off. Um, I also think too, uh, Galette's obviously is a staple. You got to stop by there, get a yellow hammer. Um, I used to say Houndstooth, but ever since they got rid of Big Bad Wolves, I the yeah, barbecue okay. nachos haven't been the same to me. Um, nope, not the same. And obviously, you know, tailgating on tailgating on the quad is it's undefeated. There's going to be the tailgating there is going to be electric this year. I, I'm I'm a little worried about the weather. Heard it's gonna be a little little crappy. Uh, there's supposed to be a, there's a hurricane coming. It's yeah, yeah. everything so, to the so east I'm, though. So I'm wor- I'm I'm hoping that that does not play an impact in this weekend in this game and everything like that. But uh, yeah. I, you got to start your day off at Industry. Got to go to Galette's. Uh, you'll never have a bad time there. Um, I know that's where I'll be. I'm gonna well I'm gonna be at the game, but you know I'm gonna be at both before. Um, if you guys see me out there, please come say hi. Um, I, I promise you, I will not try and big league you. I'm just a guy who makes memes. <laughs> After that, what's a, what's a Sabinade? I need to know. Sabinade is. is, it's a, it is a signature drink at, um, at, uh, industry. I wish I could tell you what's in it, but it is <laughs> deliciousness. I've never and asked. I, I just drink it. Same. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I've definitely put worse things in my body, so but it gets the job done. I promise you. Apparently, they're making a DeBoer drink as well, which Ooh. I can't wait for. Uh, there And also, I've lately, and I don't know if you've done it yet, I go to Sessions when I go back in the town, the cocktail bar. I... Great, great I... service. <laughs> it's a uh, fantastic service. Great cocktails. Um they have a really good old fashioned. They have a great express martini. Uh, it, it's good for it's good for an after game bar if you're a little older like me now. Mm-hmm. Kind of kind of season myself a little bit, um, and it's good for a Friday night. So I I, I take that. I, I don't go as hard as I used to anymore. Believe it or not. No, once Galette started actually like getting nicer, the it's building too nice. itself it's too nice. Um, I, I used, to, I used to throw up in that like, bathroom. Where's it's too nice. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, the bathroom has a full door? Oh, it's oh, it's it's like clean too. Like I don't it's like so it. Nice. Like it there's room you can walk around. I don't know. It it's lost its so, charm. It, it has. has. That it's that happened with 1831 too. That used to be our go-to bar. And then you it got- could not pay me enough money in the world for me to go to 1831 now. No, not anymore. Once like Jeremy Shelley stopped working there and they redid it and it got <laughs> nice, we just we can't go back. That is, a, um, that is a name I have not heard in a while. <laughs> right? We're old. That's where we're at, guys. Um, But on that note, Cruz, thank you so much for coming on and chatting. Alabama football and college football in general. Before we let you go, tell everybody where they can find you. What socials you're on, what your handle is, so that they can uh, go and click follow. Yeah, uh, you can find me on all the platforms, any any place you get your social media at the Real Cruz Ox. Um, by the way, final score prediction: Alabama twenty seven, Georgia twenty one. I love it. That's a home game. That's a good game. Good pick. I like, good pick, I like that take. And then and then Bama and Tennessee are undefeated going into the third Saturday in October. Ooh. What's your prediction? What's what's that, the score? Th- that one's that one's too close to predict. I got to see what happens now, uh, barring inter- injuries and anything like this. But I will say this: Tennessee's good. That Nico kid's good. Josh Hi- Josh Heupel's a real deal. Uh, I like what they did. They won me some money this weekend. Um, they, uh, they're good. They really are. The what the SEC is, I think, right now top like top heavy as far as like what we have. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you, I I'd say right now you can make the case that. Bama, Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, Tennessee, 
And I guess if you want to throw Missouri in there, if you still believe in them, that's, that's six top 15 teams. Yeah. Yeah. And Vandy. I love me some Vandy. Good <laughs> yes. This later half of the season is just going to be chef's kiss, hopefully, uh, but there will be tears be wild. as well. It's going to yes. be wild. Um, thank you so much, Cruz. Anytime. We'll have Are to you have me? you back on, hopefully, when we get to playoff time. Oh, absolutely. All right, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, what an awesome interview. Had an absolute blast. I mean, more it's double I Alabama. I don't, I don't, I, we don't, I don't need more Bama people, people, Wes. Why do you keep booking the Bama people? We've already got Jesse full time. Do we need more? <laughs> well, it seemed appropriate <laughs> with uh, what's about to transpire. It, it could have been right, another so. Georgia person, Matt. I would rather eat glue. I think, and we've only done that like once, I think. I think we need to do more of that. So. We've done it. No, before. no, we don't, need, we, we don't need more Georgia yeah. people. I'm surrounded by them at work. I don't need that here in my free time. <laughs> We'll have uh, we'll have you and Grant on at the same time. That'll be a, that'll be a blast. So <laughs> we get we're not going to finish an episode. <laughs> well, that's true. It'll just me be me and Grant just zinging off each other the entire time. It's an awful idea. That's that's fair. That's fair. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into the upcoming games and uh, make some predictions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to. All right, the first game we're going to talk about for the upcoming week is Kentucky 2-2, two and 0-2 two, uh, and two in the SEC at number 6 Ole Miss, 4-0. Oh, they have not played an SEC game yet. Noon on ABC. Um, I think being a home game for Ole Miss helps here. Uh, Kentucky keeps it close. they got a good defense. Uh, they'll keep it close for a little bit, uh, but then just too much offense from Ole Miss. I'm going Ole Miss here, 35-17. to 17. Jesse, what do you got? I'm going to be really upset if Matt starts to come back in the pick with these dice and I may go buy a dice myself. Um, yeah. But I, I agree. I think Kentucky had a great showing against UGA. Clearly their defense was something to, to really take note of. Unfortunately with Ole Miss field goals are not going to win the ball game for you. So I'm going to pick Ole Miss in this. I agree. I think it's going to be close in the first half. And then the second half, I just think the defense of Kentucky is not going to be able to hold down that, Lane Kiffin offense. So I'm picking Ole Miss 28 to 13. All right, Matt. <laughs> no, shoot. I lost. Anyway, that won't work. Uh, hold on. <laughs> there goes a field goal. For okay. Us. So I think, I think Ole Miss wins this game. Uh, I'm going to say 38, 24 Ole Miss. I All really right. don't think, I don't think Kentucky's Kentucky, Kentucky, Georgia is not really a good in, indication on how good that, Kentucky defense is. I I just eh. okay, that's fair. Like All right, let's uh, let's move to Arkansas at uh, number twenty four, Texas A and M. Uh, Arkansas being three and one, one and zero in the SEC. A and M being three and one, one and zero, one and zero in the SEC. That is three thirty on ESPN. Uh, look, Arkansas is coming off a big win, uh, enjoying that hype. A uh, and M is coming off a struggle win against Bowling Green. So uh, they've probably had a rough week in practice, I, I think is fair to say. Um, <clears throat> I think that plus being at Kyle Field gives the Aggies the edge here. And I'm going to go A&M 27 to 24. Jesse, what do you got? Bobby Petrino, I just gave you a helmet sticker. So do not let me down, sir. <laughs> but I think Arkansas to me has a little bit more of an identity than Texas A&M. I recognize Arkansas is not ranked while Texas A&M is, and they're playing at Kyle Field. I think if it were a night game, I'd be a little more nervous. I know the 12th man shows up regardless, but I'm going to go with Arkansas in this one. And again, we saw Texas A&M kind of struggle win. So yeah, I'm going Razorbacks in this, in a really close one, 28 to 27. And after all, we just said rankings don't matter. So Matt. Yeah. What do you got? It's a good pick. It's a good pick. I like it. Uh, in fact, I like it so much. I'm going to stick with the Hogs too. I'm going to say Arkansas 2014. How many <laughs> sides on that dice do you have? <clears throat> well, it, see, I've got lots. There's lots of dice. Oh she gosh, you do. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. Um, next, uh, number 21, Oklahoma, three and one, oh, and one in the SEC at Auburn, two and two, oh, and one in the SEC, 340 on ABC. 
Um, yeah, both offenses have been struggling mightily, uh, but I did like how Hawkins looked in, in that OU offense. Uh, obviously, you don't want a quarterback controversy, but you also want whoever provides the best chance to win to start. So I, th I think Hawkins does that. Uh, that said, both of these defenses are good, and Auburn has major questions of their own at, uh, at their own quarterback position. So uh sounds like it's a good possibility that Peyton Thorne will start again uh, <coughs> after uh, Hank Brown's disastrous start against New Mexico. Uh, in a wild, a wild twist, though, uh, one Auburn website posted an article saying it seems clear that Peyton Thorne isn't interested at all in mentoring Hank Brown. Um, so it sounds like there's some animosity there in that QB room. It could make things interesting. That just adds a whole new layer that I didn't even, I wasn't even aware existed. So, uh, I, I find that interesting. Uh, I think Hugh Freeze finds that nauseating. Uh, I'm going, uh, OU in this one, uh, 20 to 17. Jesse, what do you got? Yeah, I think Oklahoma is probably wanting to clean up a lot this week i think they're a little bit embarrassed because they got their their chance at a true sec program and in norman and it just didn't go well and auburn had a lot of issues and if there is some animosity there ugh. so yeah. i'm picking the sooners in this one 35 to 17 all right matt what you got yeah i am um, oh wait nice. um <laughs> Okay, good. They were going with what I was thinking, too. Um, yeah, I just – Oklahoma's defense is really good. Um, granted, they weren't great, They were, but they're good. They're good. They're, they're, they're decent. Um, I think they're going to do a better job of keeping Auburn's offense kind of bottled up than they did against Tennessee. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Oklahoma to win this thing by 10. So Oklahoma 30-20. All right. All right, next is Mississippi State, 1-3, and 0-1 oh, in the SEC at number one, Texas, 4-0. Oh. Uh, they have not played an SEC game yet, and that was 4-15 on SEC Network. Um, yeah, poor Mississippi State. If they couldn't make it close against Florida on the road, uh, it definitely won't be close against Texas on the road. I'm going Texas 49-10. to 10. Jesse, what do you got? It's just, it's and it's a dry heat, you know? So it's, it's, just, dry it's heat. not going to feel good. Mississippi is a very humid place. It's just... Oy, honestly, somebody needs to step in because this is just it's it's going to be unfair, truly. Uh, obviously, I'm picking the Longhorns in this one, 52 to 10. All right, Matt, what you got? Um, I think you need the dice. For this. The dice are wrong in this one. Okay, uh, I'm <laughs> going to go ahead and and go with originally thought. I think <clears throat> Texas is just too good. Uh, they're still not the real UT, by the way. I don't care what Cody says. Um, that being said, I I think that they're going to probably be with it in the nature of their life. Uh, it's like the Ralph Wiggum uh, um, meme that you see. Stop hitting him, he's already dead! Like, that'll be <laughs> Texas fans in the third quarter. So I'm going to say Texas 48-14 here. All right. Uh, Jesse, when you said it wasn't fair, for some reason in my head, I got the vision of Anakin Skywalker going, how can you do this? It's unfair. Anyway, um, never seen Star Wars. <laughs> I know I was, that was more for Matt's benefit Jesse. there. Um, it's it's literally like six hours of your life. Take six hours of your life and do yourself a favor and at least watch the original trilogy. That's all you have to do. After that, we'll stop talking about it. I doubt that. Oh, all right. Let's move to uh, number two, Georgia, three and zero, one and zero in the SEC at number four, Alabama. 3-0, and uh, and they have not played an SEC game yet. This is 7.30 on ABC. Um, so you guys have heard ACDC's Highway to Hell, I presume. Uh, but while uh, well, Georgia's schedule this year is the highway from hell. So um, first off, I'd like to say that I've been burned so many times by Alabama. It's pretty much like third degree burns at this point. So um over the years, I've just kind of come to expect the worst and hope for the best against them. So uh, there have been ridiculous plays. There have been officiating debacles. There's been a bunch of times I think it's been obvious that Georgia has been playing scared, uh, both players and the coaches. It's like they see Bama uniforms on the field and they immediately crap their pants. Uh, with the exception of the national championship uh, in Indy when hope didn't betray us for the first time in over 40 years. <laughs> 
one common denominator, though, has been Nick Saban. Obviously, he's not there anymore. Uh, I think Georgia has had a few tests this year. Obviously, Clemson with their good defense right out of the gate and Kentucky, uh, while their offense has struggled, had a great defense to put up a fight as well. Um, and the poor performance of that Kentucky game together with a bye week has probably been the bane of every Georgia player's existence <laughs> with the coaches letting them hear about it, I'm sure. Um, and Bama's a good team, an amazing team with tons of talent, uh, but we really haven't seen them tested by a good team, really, um, in, uh, in in reality this year. So South Florida was their, their biggest test yet, uh, or yeah, uh, but Wisconsin game was a completely – a complete letdown uh, in terms of competition that they could provide. Uh, and that game really wasn't a game uh, almost from the beginning. So I, I think uh, Bama is tested here. Obviously it's at home. Uh, certainly Georgia will be tested once again. Um, I think, I think Georgia is going to have to minimize the big chunk plays. I think if they can do that and minimize those big plays, they've got a chance. Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say they do it. Uh, I'm going to go Georgia 27 to 24. Jesse. What you got? Yeah, this one's huge. I, I'm so excited for an SEC night game in Brantony Stadium at State Field in Brantony Stadium. And for it to be against Georgia is is huge. I know a lot of people are talking about the fact that Alabama is going in as an underdog in in Brantony. And I'm fine with it. I, so I would actually one and a half points. It. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not like we're, you know, an underdog by like 14 points, but I would prefer to be seen as the underdog because I think that gives the team motivation. That is exactly. And coach DeBoer came out this week and already said it, that is blank. Like just, even if you doubt us a little bit, if one person doubts us, like that's the mentality. Um, and I think the players have really rallied around that this year. So I'm going to pick Bama in this. And, and I think you had it right on when, when you said Georgia needs to minimize those really big chunk plays but I think what Alabama needs to do and what I hope they've been doing in practice and what we we talked about coming out of the Wisconsin game is they've got to get better at those chip away plays at just yard by yard down by down getting down the field and and not relying so much on those huge explosive plays I think you'll see some of it or, or at least some attempts but I hope that we're going to start to see some schemes that get us down the field, maybe a little bit slower. I also think, and we talked about it with Cruz is I would have to agree. I don't think we've seen the full Alabama play book yet. I think he's right in that we've been playing, not necessarily conservatively because obviously there's big explosive plays, but we haven't shown all of our cards because we haven't had to. I think you're going to see some more cards in this game, or I hope you do. Um, so I'm going to pick Bama and I'm going to flip your pick. I'm going to say Bama, 27 24 i'm hoping that bobo is playing conservative so far as well if not then we we need to have a different conversation matt what's your pick <laughs> uh I, first off i just kind of hope neither team wins because i have both of them with every fiber of my being the, the opposite only way of, can i make... just hope both teams have fun yeah <laughs> no i hope they have a miserable time i hope I hope the buses break down on the way to the stadium. Uh, I hope that whatever food they got has gone off. Uh, I, I wish nothing but. Matt woke but up and chose violence. I did. I did. The only way you could make me hate this game even more is if it was some sort of three-way football game between, and you throw Florida in there. That's the only way you would make me hate it more. I hate it more than I already do. That being said, that let's would see what the dice say. Oh. Wes, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go with UJ. 28-20. Hey, you know, it's all good. So we'll we'll see it. Could be a good luck. Maybe it's better. That, that, that might be the Lee Corso kiss of death right there, Wes. <laughs> could, I mean, it could we, be. we won't know until about 1130 Saturday night. That's true. That is true. <clears throat> all right. Well, let's move to the final game of the evening, and that is South Alabama 2-2 two and two at number 14 LSU 3-1. and one. Is 745 on the SEC network. Yes, sir. What you got, Matt? Hold, hold on a minute. Why is this game even happening so late? Like, why is this not a noon kickoff? <laughs> South Alabama? It's got a direction in its name. We already know which way the wind's blowing on this game. You assume maybe LSU just has a certain uh, monopoly on how, how many night games they get, or I don't know. 
Maybe. Couldn't tell you, to be honest with you. I can't um, believe the SEC Network is deciding to show show this. They probably I, have to because like, they I, probably didn't get the rights to the bigger games. Like, yeah. you could have shown Mississippi State and Texas. That would have been better. Except, you know, go ahead, well, they are. They are. Show, well, yeah, I guess yeah, part of they're the showing day. them earlier in the day. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. They could have flipped it. I don't know. Um, so South Alabama's offensive coordinator, Rob Ezel, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is going to have to do a really good Saban impersonation if South Alabama is going to hang in this one. So I don't know if you guys recall, he's the one who used to do Saban impersonations in the locker room. Jesse, I'm sure you remember. Um, mm. Yes, uh, LSU. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he is pretty good. LSU is going to win this one, though. They're going to roll. I got uh, 45-24 LSU. Jesse, what do you got? South Alabama is going to need to do a University of South Florida impression yeah. <laughs> from how they played against us. But I think this is just unfair playing in Death Valley at night. I just, it's me. Um, it's not quite as bad probably as Texas playing Mississippi State, but it's right on up there. So I'm going to go with the Tigers. I'm going to say 42 to 9. If you go to Rob's Wikipedia page, it has all his, you know, coaching stats and stuff like that. And then it has a one little section that says known for Nick Saban impersonation. Uh, <laughs> Matt, what do you got? Just LSU. It doesn't matter. It is, uh, doesn't matter. Score matters. For the pick okay, fine. Hold on. Hold on. Let's let's stick with the program here. Hold on. I got to get two more. Di okay, hold on. Yeah, LSU 42-10. All right. I didn't and, need dice for that. I appreciate your commitment to the bit as well. It's awesome. So, <laughs> um, all right. Well, that does it for the games of the upcoming weekend. And that does it for this episode. So uh, let's get everybody out of here. If you would like to contact us, please email us at pigskinsandpageantry at gmail.com. We are at pigskinsandpageantry on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And we are at PPSEC Podcast on Twitter. We are it's, available for Hey, you got it right. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Wes. You I did it right that time. I, I was waiting to see what you were going to do. <clears throat> we are available okay. for download on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, TuneIn Radio, and most podcasting apps for iPhone, Android, and other operating systems. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe and review five stars. We would love that. Increase our visibility and uh, increase our likelihood of having wonderful conversations with people like yourselves. So a uh, big shout out to Cruz for coming on the show tonight. We had an absolute blast talking to you, man. Um, and then uh, big weekend coming up. Until next time, this is Wes. Go dogs. Let all those naysayers know. Roll tide. I hope the potato salad goes off before before the game starts up. Go balls. I hope they both suck. And every time I hear Lank, I think about Pat McAfee's reaction to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs>